seminar on victorious Christian living. This 10-part seminar is a sequel to the basic seminar, How to Live the Victorious Christian Life. The speakers are Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum, a husband and wife team, and Preston Gillum. The Gillums minister through Gillum Ministries Incorporated, a non-denominational, Christ-centered counseling office specialized to work with vocational Christian workers. In this segment of the seminar, we will hear Bill as he deals with the topic of forgiveness. There is perhaps no weapon quite so lethal and frequently used in the enemy's arsenal as guilt. Let's join Bill now for the session, Forgiveness and Forgiving Others. Well, thanks for coming out again tonight. I really do appreciate your faithfulness and trust that the Holy Spirit will bless you through this lecture on forgiveness and how to forgive others. I want to teach you three things, basically. Number one, that you and I who are in Christ, who have been saved, are totally forgiven of all our sins, past sins, present sins, and future sins, all sins. Number two, that all of this took place at the cross of Jesus Christ from God's heavenly perspective. But from the believer's perspective, it all took place when you received Christ as Savior at salvation. Number three, that confessing your sins to God does not mean asking Him to forgive you. If indeed He has already forgiven you of all your sins, then to ask Him to forgive you really is unbelief. It's saying to Him, I don't believe that you really have forgiven me, so I'm going to ask you to do it another time. Confession, of course, is biblical, but confession serves another purpose than trying to get God's forgiveness. Confession is to clear the air between you and God, not from his viewpoint, because you see, he's already solved his problem at the cross. The air's clear from his viewpoint. But from man, the Christian man's viewpoint, when he sins, that clogs it up. From the man's viewpoint, he feels inhibited about getting into fellowship with God, and this inhibition stifles the relationship. Okay, now then, <clears throat> let's put God in here. And the scriptures say that God created all things. All things were created by him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So if God created all things, that means there's no such thing as a natural phenomenon. If it exists, he did it. And that includes the time dimension. So here we'll put down BT for the beginning of time. And over here we'll put down ET for the ending of time. Now, if God created time, then is God time dimensional? Answer, no. That would be the creation controlling the creator. And that can't be true. Therefore, God is not time-dimensional. He is supra-time. He created time, therefore, he is not controlled by time. Okay? In other words, then, God sees forever into the future, and he sees forever into the past, and to him it's all present tense. Pow, you see. He sees everything like a person in a helicopter looking down, and he sees the whole thing down there. Now, you and I are not like that here on planet Earth. Here's the way we operate. Here we have B for birth, and uh, let's draw a timeline over here, and let's have that D for death. Now, <clears throat> this timeline then is let's have this represent your lifeline on planet Earth, and let's say it's like the main street of an old Western movie where episodes in your life appear like storefront buildings along the main street. Now, here is S for salvation when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And over here is T for today. Now then, time critter, from your viewpoint, T represents today. Everything from T backward represents the past. Everything from T forward represents the future. So in a way, it must be like you're watching a television monitor 
that has a videotape playing through it. The picture represents the present. That's now, that's T. The take-up reel represents everything from B to T, the past, you see. You've already seen that picture. The feeder reel represents from T over to D. That's the future to you, time critter. But from God's viewpoint, he sees the whole thing as if the videotape were stretched out end to end. And he looks at the whole thing simultaneously. Pow! No verb tenses, you see. He refers to himself as I am. Always present tense, you see. Now, let's take this concept then and examine it and see if we can come up with a better understanding about sins and God's forgiveness. Now, when I got saved, this is what I understood happened to me. I had committed a whole bunch of sins between the time I got born and the time I got born again. And so it was explained to me that when I got saved, what God did was he forgave me of all my S-I-N-S from salvation backward. But that what I would have to do is ask him for forgiveness every time I sinned from there on out and he would then forgive me. And so, here then I committed another sin, and so God is faithful, and he forgave me for that sin that I committed, and then I asked him to forgive me of. And so, I committed another one, and then he, when I asked him to forgive me, he was faithful to uh, do that, and so he forgave me of that. And so, I went along on this uh, this plan that I was discipled with. And one day, while Annabelle and the kids and I were on the way to Sunday school, we got into a big one, and I committed 17 sins <laughs> on the way to Sunday school. Now, <clears throat> it was mainly between Annabelle and me, but, you know, Prest opened his mouth. Of course, I whacked him. I was really... Uh, <laughs> wanting to whack Annabelle, but that, you know, that won't fly. <laughs> I was so mad when I got to church that I did not ask God to forgive me. I missed the whole sermon, the whole point. And it was sometime Monday before I finally got around to talking to the Lord about my uh, forgiveness. And so I began to ask him to forgive me. Now, you know, I could not remember all 17 of those sins that I committed. I remember that one. I mean, that was the biggie, man. That's the one where I really hit her, you know, and wound up the argument. And so I, I asked him for that, and I felt pretty good about that one, that he had forgiven that. But now, what about these other ones here? Well, that was explained to me this way. God only holds you responsible for the ones that you are aware of. You know, a just God would never hold you responsible for sins you weren't even aware of. So in other words, I guess he kind of sweeps those under the rug, kind of. You know, that won't fly again. If I understand God, there's one thing he really is uptight about and he ain't sweeping under any rug, and that is sin, right? He is tremendously uptight about sins to the degree that he came and actually died for me and for you in order to satisfy the requirement of payment for those sins. So, that creates a kind of a problem then in my theology. Now, in addition to that, we have still another problem, and that is, what about the sins that I am going to commit sometime between today and the time that I die? What about future sins? And some guy says, oh, well, now, Bill, God does not require anything of that. You've got to get there and commit the sin, and then you ask him to forgive you, and then he's faithful to forgive you of that sin. But now, wait a minute, gang. If he's up here in a helicopter looking down on my videotape, he already sees those sins, and they ain't future to him. They're very contemporary. They're very much now from the helicopter view. Do you see that? So this theory then has a big hole in it. And I began to ask God about it. How, Lord, how does this thing of forgiveness fit in to the Word of God? And I believe that he showed me a few things. Now, when I was a little kid, 
there weren't any speed limits. <clears throat> you could travel as fast as you wanted to because nobody could travel fast. We had an old uh, 1928 Chevy, and uh, we'd run that baby. You know, it sounded like it was coming apart, so we'd shut her down to about 30, and we'd run it like that. The uh, curves on the highway were flat. They were not banked, and, you, you know, no problem. Well, <clears throat> along about, uh, I don't know what year, but uh, Henry Ford or someone designed something called the Lincoln Zephyr. Now, this is the prototype to what is now the Continental. And it was a 12-cylinder car, as well as I remember, and that baby would go 70 easy. And a rich man in our town named Mr. Deming bought a Lincoln Zephyr. And he'd go by you on the highway, see, like that. Now, I want to ask you a question. Was Mr. Deming a speeder? Answer, no, because there wasn't any law to break. So Mr. Deming was not a speeder, all right? Sometimes he'd go by, his wife would be driving, you know, and he'd be in the passenger side, and as he'd go by, he'd reach out and strike his match on your car, you know, light his cigar and <laughs> went by. <laughs> now, you know I'm kidding. He's a pretty good old boy. <laughs> all right, well, the state legislature got a little upset at some of these uh, wealthy guys driving these automobiles like that. And so they passed a speed law. And so they go out there and they stick up a speed limit sign. I don't remember what it was. Let's say it was speed limit 50. Now, what does the law do? That speed law revealed what Mr. Deming was, a speeder. You see that? So the purpose then for our discussion is that the purpose of that law was to reveal what Mr. Deming was, a speeder. You see that? All right. <clears throat> now, the Ten Commandments serve many purposes. One of them is to reveal the character of God. There are other purposes, but one of the biggie purposes of the Ten Commandments, according to the Word of God, is to reveal to man that man is a speeder. The Bible would say sinner, okay? To reveal that about man, that he is a speeder. Now, this is not, the, the purpose of the law was not performance-based acceptance so that God would reveal to man what the standards are, and man then has to perform up to these standards, and if he can perform perfectly enough, then God will pay him off with acceptance. That's not it at all. Now, God does want us to obey the law, yes, the law of love and the Ten Commandments, but that was not the purpose that you and I are discussing tonight. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 verse 24. And let's see what this interesting verse, and there, there are several of these verses like this in the third chapter of Galatians, and I would encourage you to check them out. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. The law is our tutor to lead us to Christ. What in the world does that mean? How is the law going to tutor us to Jesus Christ? Well, let's see if we can get some insight into this. Now, I have here a transparency of a timeline stretching from Adam on out into the future. Now then, here we have the beginning, Adam's fall. And then we have Abraham's call. A little later on, we have the law given. This is where the Ten Commandments were given. Now, gang, looky here. At Adam's fall, this man became spiritually dead. We've already taught on that. He and Eve then produced children with dead spirits, standard equipment, arms, legs, ears, eyes, noses, and dead spirits. Standard equipment. You see, this is the way we all came in to planet Earth. Now then, when the law was given then, here comes Moses coming down off of the mountain, and he hangs ten here on the side somehow, and the people take a look at these ten commandments. 
Now, the purpose of the law is to lead them to Christ, but they don't understand that aspect of it. They view this as performance-based acceptance with God. And so what they start trying to do is chin on God's chinning bar. They try to perform perfectly so they can get acceptance from God. When in fact, the purpose that God intended that you and I are discussing tonight is that they would be frustrated by this effort to gain acceptance with God. And also, this law is to reveal to them that they are speeders, that they are hopeless sinners who have already broken all these laws. And thus, the law was set up there to nail them so they would understand that they were guilty before God. All right. Now, Jesus' birth occurred at this point on the timeline, and 30 years later, he began his ministry in, on planet Earth. Now, I want to point out something to you, brothers and sisters, that has really helped me a great deal, and that is that the law prevailed all through this period of time, even through Jesus Christ's ministry on planet Earth. Jesus Christ's ministry on planet Earth was all under law, totally under law, all right? <clears throat> the law then was satisfied at the cross, and the life was provided at the cross. What I mean by that? I mean that Christ now can enter into a believer and life out the law of love through the believer, the life was provided, all right? But I want to caution you. All of his ministry was under law. Therefore, listen to me now. Therefore, the Gospels are really law books. Don't you hear me saying, toss out the Gospels? I am not saying that any more than I'm saying, toss out the Psalms. But I am saying this that we have to carefully examine teaching of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ to see what his motive was when he taught the way he did. Look for law in it and look for grace in it and rightly divide the word of truth. I think that's what the Bible is meaning when it says rightly divide the word of truth. Be able to separate the law from the grace and see how they all fit together. Do not hear me in any way saying we're going to toss anything out. You with me? It all fits, but we've got to see how and see what the purpose of it is. All right? All right. So Jesus came to planet Earth and started his ministry, and he came up here and he saw some people who were chinning on the chinning bar. This is the big bunch, and they're chinning on the chinning bar, the plain vanilla folks. And he says, uh, what are you boys doing? And, oh, we're chinning on the chinning bar here. We're trying to keep God's law. Well, how you doing? Now, we ain't doing too good. Uh, we fall off this bar quite a lot. But now, Jesus, if you want to see some super chinners, you go down the street a couple blocks, hang a right. There, let's see, about five minutes, old George is going to show up down there. He prays the prettiest prayers you nearly ever saw. Reads them off a cue card you know, every, every day. And uh, he'll have his trumpeters there with him. This is the day he usually gives his money. And it's quite a show. Now, if you want to see somebody that can really perform, go down there and see old George. And so Jesus goes down there, and here's old George. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm chinning on the chinning bar, uh, keeping God's law. And by the way, we've expanded it to about 300 and some odd do's and 300 and some odd don'ts now. And um, uh, Jesus said, well, uh, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, do you ever slip off the bar? No, nope, never slipped yet. Been chinning here for 32 years, and I, I've never fallen. And um, I know, I, I've, I've never seen anybody fall. Matter of fact, uh, you know, in our little club that we're in called the Pharisees, you know, we call it the, the non-fallers club. <clears throat> now, if you really want to see some people fall, <laughs> we thank God every day we're not like that bunch down there. Now, you, you can go down there and watch them. And Jesus says, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I want to deliver a message this afternoon out here on the side of the hill that I'm going to call the Sermon on the Mount in my book I'm going to write. 
And, and so if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like for you to come out. And, and so he delivered the Sermon on the Mount, and it was downhill all the way after that, right? Because what he did was he took bar chinning out of the realm of the overt and put it into the realm of the thought line. Man, if you ever even thought about going 70, you're stuck now. You see this? He says, not only are you guilty if you have committed adultery, but if you've even fantasized about that, you've had it. You've fallen off the bar. You're a sinner. Not only are you guilty if you've killed somebody, but if you've even had hatred in your heart towards your brother, you've had it. So you see, he, he raised the chinning bar 87 notches is what he did. You see that? And when he did that, see, the big bunch, they said, you know, Jesus, you know, please don't help us anymore. You know, we thought that you... Were. And the little bunch got mad at him and ultimately killed him for trying to infer that they were slipping off the bar. So you see what Jesus was doing was erecting a more sophisticated speed limit to reveal to every person who heard him at the Sermon on the Mount and who every person who's ever heard him since that you are a hopeless sinner. I'm talking to lost folks now, okay? A hopeless speeder with absolutely no hope. And so somewhere along the line, some people began to ask, Sir, don't you have plan B? whereby we can get to God. I mean, we're obviously not going to make it this way. And he says, by the way, I am plan B. Although I'm not really plan B. I'm plan A. Ain't no plan B. See, <clears throat> the law is simply a tutor to frustrate you and lead you to plan A. That's what I am. I'm the only way. Now, if you come to me, I will in no way cast you out. I'm the way. You come to me, and I will bring you to God the Father. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? Well, this is very pertinent now to our subject matter. The Lord Jesus' goal then was to reveal speeders and convict speeders and offer pardons through faith in him, you see. Well, there's some interesting verses in Matthew chapter 6 that are very relevant to our subject tonight. Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 14 and 15. Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, dear people, any way you want to look at that, that is performance-based forgiveness. It says that you have to earn your forgiveness. What you got to do is forgive that person over there who hurt you. And if you can muster up enough forgiveness to forgive that guy, then and then only will you become acceptable to God and forgiven by God. Performance-based forgiveness. Now, you and I are born again, and we know that there's just something wrong with that. There's something haywire. But our Lord Jesus himself taught it. So how in the world are we going to rightly divide the word of truth? Here's how. We've got to understand that he taught this to people under law to raise the chinning bar 87 notches for them to nail them and convict them of their, the fact that they're sinners. So here's a, here's a couple of guys in the crowd. And uh, when he told the adultery story, that didn't bother them too bad. 
He told the murder story. That didn't bother them too bad. But when he told this forgiveness story, ugh, it nailed them. Because they had this unforgiveness toward this person and they'd been struggling with it for years and they never could get rid of it. And he nailed them, see? Now, if you'll go down through the Sermon on the Mount, looking at it through those glasses that I've just described for you to rightly divide the, the word, you look at how many people get nailed in the Sermon on the Mount. Does it get pretty near everybody? He winds up administering the coup de grace. He says, now be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Try that one on. See? If you pass any of those others, try this one. It blew them away. You see? All right. Now, dear people, I don't mean to be critical of anybody, but I believe that there are a lot of Christian teachers who take a verse just like I've just described here, and they'll teach this to a born-again person and tell a born-again person he's got to go forgive a guy before he can get forgiven. And that's not rightly dividing the word of truth. See, that's taking law and mixing it with grace. We've got to see how this thing fits together. Now, <clears throat> to do this, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. <clears throat> and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also, now look at the verb tense, has forgiven you. Has forgiven you. It's already forgiven been done. You see the difference now. When I read you those verses out of the Sermon on the Mount, what did they say? You forgive and then God will pay you off. This verse says you've already been paid off. Now that you've been paid off, go forgive your brother. Do You see the difference? These two passages say exactly the opposite thing from one another. Now, how in the world are we going to reconcile these two passages? We're going to do it by rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to understand that Jesus' motivation over here with the Sermon on the Mount was to convict speeders, you see? Now then, let's see how this forgiveness thing is going to fit together because there are many, many verses now that talk about forgiveness. I don't have time to read all of them, but they talk about the fact that we are totally forgiven as Christians. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 14 through 17, just jot them down. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Now, <clears throat> let's turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 and read through that and see how this is set up. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Pay special attention to the verb tenses now, people. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that means you were lost, he made you alive together with him. There's your new verb. Look at this verb tense having forgiven us all our transgressions. How many? All of them. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. A-L-L, -L, people. All your sins. Look here, look here. If you were to claim that all of your sins are forgiven, and if you were to claim that you have already been raised up in Christ and you're seated at the Father's right hand right now, and that the Father has just got his arm around you, and he's just snuggling you up to him, and he just loves you, and he looks at you, and there's no fire leaping out of his eyes, 
to consume you. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, he'll condemn what you do at times, but he'll never condemn your person. He'll never condemn you. He loves you just because you're his. He accepts you, right? Now, just think about that. Just fantasize that. Close your eyes. Think with me. Just meditate how he's loving you. Thank him for how forgiven you are. Thank him for taking care of that. He took care of all your sins in Christ. And while you're thinking that, just try to generate an, a hateful, unforgiving thought about somebody that did something wrong to you. Now, that won't fly, will it? Open your eyes. You see, if you would set your mind on how totally forgiven you are, that positiveness would so motivate you that there'd be no room for this unforgiving thought that the power of indwelling sin is trying to give you through those old fleshly patterns that we've been describing all through the seminar. Do you see that? Now, let's take this scripture that we just talked about, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, and talk about this thing called the certificate of debt. Back in that particular culture, the language of the legal system was Greek. And there was a phenomenon that went like this. If a man had committed crimes, a certificate of debt was prepared against him. All of his crimes were listed on this. He was tried and convicted. He was sentenced to prison. This certificate of debt enumerating all of his sins for which he was guilty was nailed to the cell door. And he stayed in that cell until every last day was paid of the sentence that he received. When he paid the last day, they would unlock the cell and take him out. They would take the certificate of debt and they would write a Greek word across this certificate of debt, and that Greek word was tetelestai. Tetelestai means paid in full. The chief magistrate would then sign his name to that document, roll it up, and hand it to this man. So long as that man had that certificate of debt with that word on it signed by the chief magistrate, he could never again be convicted for those particular sins against society. How precious do you think that certificate of debt would be to that guy? He'd preserve it with his life, right? Because that would be keeping him from ever being charged again with those sins. Now, the Lord Jesus spoke seven sayings off the cross. He spoke Hebrew Aramaic. But, of course, the New Testament is written in Greek. One of those sayings is interpreted in English, it is finished, which he spoke just before he died, right? Do you know what word in the Greek has been translated into English, it is finished? To tell us die. To tell us die. So here's what these verses are saying that the Lord Jesus did with A-L-L -L of your S-I-N-S. They were all enumerated, your sins. Sin number one, number two, number three, number four, million and one, million and two, etc., etc. And he took all of your sins. And he wrote, to Tetelestai, and he signed it, Jesus, with his blood. And he has rolled this thing up figuratively and handed it to you and has said to you, go and sin no more. You are forgiven of A-L-L, -L, your sins. Dear people, time dimensionally, how many of your sins were future tense when Jesus died at the cross? 
all of them, all of them. But from the helicopter viewpoint, looking down, can you see how God solved his dilemma with your S-I-N-S? Bang, at a moment in time, from the helicopter view. But 2,000 years later, you appropriated that by faith, by getting saved. Do you see how that could be? All right. Now then, someone says, well, Bill, if you teach this kind of stuff to believers, they'll just go out and plunge into sin <coughs> recklessly. You teach them that they're forgiven. No, quite the contrary. You teach them that they're forgiven and you teach them that they've got a new heart, who we really are in Christ. <clears throat> I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a pliable heart. You've had heart surgery. You've had heart transplant. And so have I. I will write my laws on their heart and on their mind. That's what he's done to you. You don't really want to sin. You're tempted, aren't you? You'd like to get your needs met, wouldn't you? But you don't want to sin to do it. Let me illustrate. Let's say it's income tax time coming up. There's some deductions that you could claim, but it's dishonest. You are tempted to claim them. You know some people who are, but your desire is to obey God and not claim those. You'd rather pay extra bucks and be okay on, 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 on the, a good fellowship with God than to cheat and have the bucks. You're tempted to, but your desire is different from your temptation. Well, then what about 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we confess our, gain, our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and so forth. I have made a search, dear people. That's the only verse that I can find after the cross. Now, I emphasize after the cross. Because remember, where did grace begin for the believer? After the cross. Now, you understand that the umbrella of God's grace is an overarching thing that goes all across time. God uh, sends rain to the unjust and everything, right? God's grace is for everyone. But in terms of salvation grace that you and I have entered into as we have done so through Jesus Christ, that began for you and me at the cross of Jesus Christ. The only verse that I can find that seems to say we are not forgiven is 1 John 1, 9. Whereas there are several that say we are totally forgiven. But look at the verse we've hung our hats on. We've hung our hats on 1 John 1, 9. You say, well, Bill, it says to confess your sin. Doesn't that mean to ask God to forgive you? No, it doesn't. Look up the word confess, and you'll find that that word means agree with. Agree with God about your sin. That's what we're exhorted to do. We are to confess our sin. Now, let me illustrate to you how that works in the believer's life. A hundred years ago, Annabelle and I had an old bulldog named Bubbles. <clears throat> and uh, she, Annabelle and I both taught school. And we'd come home, no kids, we'd come home 4.35 o'clock. And we left Bub in the house all day, little old three-room house. We'd unlock the door. Great family reunion. She'd wiggle all over, you know, and jump up on you. Now, the first order of business, take Bubbles to the back door where the kitchen is, open the door, let her out in the backyard to uh, do her business. She's been holding her water all day long, see. All right. <clears throat> On a couple of occasions during the years that we owned Bub, we came home, key in the lock, rattle, rattle, open it up, no bubbles. Hey, Bub, no Bub. And so we go looking for her. And we go in the bedroom, and the bedspread has a tuck in it where she's gone under the bed, see. <clears throat> and you lift up the skirt, and you look under there, and she's under there, paralyzed with fear, see. <clears throat> now, you go back in the kitchen and here's this big puddle <laughs> by the back door, see, where she didn't make it that day. She couldn't hold it, see. Now, listen to me. Oh, this is so beautiful. Her sin had separated her from her God. 
See, I'm her God. You see that? Who had the problem? Bub or me? She had the problem. Her guilt made her get under the bed and hide from me. I'd already take care of the problem from my viewpoint. I knew when I locked her up in the house that sooner or later we were going to have a puddle on the floor back there. It was inevitable. But do you know why I was willing to do that? Because I knew Bubbles' heart. I knew her heart. I knew her heart was it. as soon as we got out of the house, she wasn't going to say, oh boy, and back to the door. I knew that. Do you see that? Dear Christian, that is you. I have shared this with a Christian. I shared this with a preacher the other day who as a young preacher had committed adultery with someone in his congregation. <clears throat> and he, he confessed it to God. He got it right with God. He got it right with the woman. They both married other people later on down the line. This is 15 years later. He called me ready to drop out of the ministry. The devil was beating on his mind like Annabelle was teaching you last session. The devil was beating on his mind. How can I stand up here and preach to these people? How can I tell these teenagers in this church to keep themselves pure when I'm such a grungy, sorry, no good, I've got all this on my conscience. I better just drop out of the ministry. I, 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 all with a northern accent. He's from the north, see. I, 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 I. Do you see that? <clears throat> we talked and counseled about who he was in Christ and about bubbles and everything. He called me one day. He said, Bill, I want to tell you something. I said, okay, what? He said, I came out from under that bed. <laughs> Do you see, dear brothers and sisters, if you somehow sense that God is holding something over you, you'll stay under that bed. You'll quit coming to church. You'll quit coming to seminars. You'll quit praying. You won't read your Bible. You won't listen to Christian music because the Satan will use it to just make you feel that much guiltier. All right. Now, dear people, <clears throat> if all of this is true, then how can I use these truths to forgive myself? How? All right. First off, if I have sinned, I am to confess it to God. Lord, I did it. I hate that. I don't want to live like that. You confess it. Okay? Now then, Thank you, God, that I am forgiven. Thank you, God, that when I did that, you didn't just turn your back on me, but you have totally taken care of all my sin, and I'm a totally forgiven person. Thank you, God. And you grit your teeth, and you set your mind, and you begin to praise him and thank him that you are a forgiven person. And rain on how you feel. If you feel guilty, it's false guilt. You see what I'm saying? You choose with your will to set your mind on how totally forgiven you are. And the power of sin will feed you all kinds of accusation. You say, rain on you. I'm not buying that. Thank you, God. All right, let's talk about forgiving somebody else. You see, you hear this. If you haven't, if you still remember it, you haven't really forgiven. That's a bunch of baloney. If fuzzy nose can feed it up to you, how long do you think it's going to be before you forget it? Till you eject, man. <laughs> right? You're never going to forget it. See? He's going to feed it to you just like he did this preacher that I just described. So here's the way to forgive somebody. You can choose with your will to forgive, even if you feel real hard toward that person. I choose to forgive her. <laughs> See? I did it. Now, once you choose, can you believe with your mind that you did it? Can you believe that? Yes, you can. You can slap mind to man around and make mind believe it. You believe it, boy. <laughs> See? And mind will say, yes, sir. See? I believe it. I did it. Now, how about feeler? I feel unforgiving. Well, rain on how I feel. See, I can't get over there to change feeler. I've got control of mind and will. That's where my battle's going to be won. 
Thank you, God, that I forgave. Thank you, God. Now, Lord, I don't feel it, but thank you, God, that I forgave. Thank you, Lord. And you confess, you grit your teeth, and you pump this through your mind how you have forgiven her for what she did. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I have forgiven her. Boy, Lord, it's neat to thou that I have forgiven her. And thank you, God, that I'm forgiven. Oh, what a wonderful joy, God. Thank you. And do you see that sooner or later, your feeler will begin to come more back into the ballpark. You see that? Dear brothers, dear sisters, the Word of God is saying that you and I are totally forgiven of all our sins. A L L. All. I beg you, I beg you, will you go with the Word of God and believe Him, or are you going to cling to your tradition? I beg you, don't stand up in your Sunday school class and pray, and God forgive us of all our sins. Now, I love you, brother. I don't mean to be beating on you. I love you. I want you to understand that what I just said, God forgive us of all our sins, that's tradition. That is not Bible. Don't you believe me? You get into that word and you see if that's tradition or if that's Bible. Father, I thank you now that we are forgiven people, a clean people, a people who are holy and blameless in your sight raised up pure and holy and you have cleansed us by your blood thank you dear Jesus thank you dear Jesus Amen isn't that a powerful truth and isn't forgiveness good news thank you again for having been with us for this session of the advanced seminar on victorious Christian living in the next two sessions, we will hear Bill and Annabelle interacting, sharing, and teaching together on the marriage relationship in a topic entitled, Defusing the Self-Destruct Marriage. for joining us for the advanced seminar on victorious Christian living, a sequel to the basic seminar, How to Live the Victorious Christian Life. The speakers are Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum. This is session eight entitled, Defusing the Self-Destruct Marriage. In this, the first part of a two-part series, Bill and Annabelle will portray the anatomy of a self-destruct marriage. Well, we want to welcome you tonight. Valentine's Day, 1985. Isn't that neat? And we really do appreciate the opportunity to be here in First Baptist Atlanta, one of our favorite places. We're going to talk tonight, giving the first part of a two-part session on defusing the self-destruct marriage. In other words, if you walk in the energy of self, then the thing is going to destruct. 
And we'd like to share some truths about how to trust Christ through me and who I am in him to defuse that situation. Our goal is not to entertain you, but to enlighten you. If you got a super marriage, to make it a super duper marriage. And if you got an average one, to make it a super one. And if, you, if your marriage is kind of on the downhill slide, to learn how to trust Jesus Christ through you to turn that thing around to the glory of Jesus Christ. Don't you want to bring glory to Jesus through your marriage? I do. I don't want to waste time, do you? I want to let him live through me to his glory. As we begin now, I think it's necessary for us to say this. The fastest growing group in our churches today is a group that you do not go out and invite people to come. And uh, you don't evangelize, nor do you witness. And you don't have socials and invite them to come. You enter this group through default, through tragedy. The one requirement to be a part of the group is that you have suffered. And uh, there are many of you here tonight. If the emotional pain represented in this auditorium tonight, if just the emotional pain could be heard, we couldn't stand it. It would be too deafening. There are enough accumulated hours of living in varied degrees of hell, going through nightmares that you never dreamed you would go through, to make any one of us fall on the floor in just a limp heap and say, I cannot go on. And of course, I'm talking about that group of people that we have labeled very poignantly single again. Um, in no way do we want to hurt you tonight. In no way do we want to drag up memories of what has happened to you. The farthest thing from our intention would be to do that, to hurt you. But I guess if there's any one group that's going to be praying, as Bill and I talk, it's going to be you. You people who are the single against. Because you know what can happen. And you know the horrible tragedy of what happens. You know the heartache. Bill and I are going to be trying desperately to wave flags of warning to the couples who are sitting here tonight and you're oblivious to what's happening. There are some of you here tonight that within a year you will have joined the group of single again. And you'll be saying, I never dreamed it could happen to me. In the years of counseling that Bill and I have gone through, we have come to see that there are common areas that devastate marriages. We see that there are, are major areas that have caused problems. So we're going to focus on four of those areas tonight. And those four areas are these. Number one, the dominant female in union with the passive male are the threatened macho male. Number two, the indulged male. Number three, communication. And number four, commitment. Now then, as we start, honey, every one of those are represented by flesh, yeah, right? right? For Christians. Uh, for, for Christians, yeah. that's right. Uh, a pattern for being dominant, a pattern for passivity, a pattern for being macho, uh, a pattern for being indulged, for not communicating, for lack of commitment. All of those, those are flesh patterns. Yeah. Okay, how do, get the, how do you review us? How do they get there? Okay, first of all, before I review it, um, you know, we're starting with the gal here, the dominant female. 
And uh, why do you think that God so oftentimes begins working on the wife first in a marriage situation? Because the wife can fulfill her role of submission all by herself. You can submit to a telephone pole. That's right. Okay? You can, you can you fill... Say, whatever you say, post. <laughs> That's right. Your turn. <laughs> you can submit to a telephone post. Yeah. But it takes two people for a position of authority to exist. You've got to have something to lead. And you cannot lead someone who refuses to be led. That's right. So I think that God very often does start in a woman. Yeah, right. Okay, now, the way these things are programmed in, again, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Now, we've used this passage before, but I want you to, I want to challenge you to study out this passage in Philippians chapter 3, about the first nine verses or so. But we're just going to look at verses 3 and 4. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And so this, of course, is the Apostle Paul. And as I said before, <clears throat> Saul generated Paul's flesh. You can see it clearly in that chapter because all of the stuff that occurs after verses 3 and 4 will be details of things that Saul did as a lost man, striving to get his needs met for self-esteem, peer acceptance, and God acceptance. Now, that's what's going to constitute the flesh. And, of course, this guy won the Heisman Trophy for flesh. He got the greatest flesh that has ever walked on planet Earth. Now, who wasn't divine? Well, Jesus didn't have flesh. I mean, well, you know what I mean. I mean, he had an earth suit, but he didn't have any old ways. So, Saul gets saved, he gets crucified with Christ. Paul then is spawned out of God's spirit gene pool. He occupies Saul's earth suit, so to speak. So, Saul's, uh, so Paul's brain is now programmed by Saul. Therefore, all we got to do is look into your background, see what happened to you all through the formative years, and we'll get a picture of your unique version of the flesh. Okay, now, honey, be, before we go on, let me ask you something. Yeah. Let's say that a person gets converted, saved, born again, <laughs> whatever you want to say, when they're six or seven. Yeah. Can those flesh patterns be built after that? Oh, or, sure. Or can you strengthen those? Oh, after? sure. Even build new ones. Because if you keep tuning in to the voice of a stranger that you've been teaching and I've been teaching about, you keep listening to those thoughts coming to you with the Georgia accent and first person singular pronouns from the power of indwelling sin after salvation, you'll even construct a brand new superhighway in there that has been totally given to you and you have, op you have grabbed it and constructed it. And so the flesh can even escalate after salvation. Okay, now then, after having that brief re review, let's look at the, the first part here. The dominant female in union with the passive male or the threatened macho male. Bill and I believe this is number one in problem marriages. I guess the best thing for us to do as we start thinking about dominant females is to go back and read about our parents in the faith, Sarah and Abraham. But they were not always Sarah and Abraham. They were Sarai and Abram. And that's very important. Why, honey? Yeah, well, names are important in Scripture, and you always need to check them out. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude, which he became. The Jews are the physical sons of Abraham. You and I are the spiritual sons of Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> the word Sarai means domineering. She wore the pants in that relationship. The word Sarah means princess, someone that you revere and want to carry around on a silver platter and minister to. Now remember that. Now Bill and I are not trying to defame these blessed people. No way. No way. But as you begin to read, oh, you, you become aware of so many things. And you see domineering Sarai, manipulating, <coughs> conniving, obeying when expedient, demanding that passive Abram do her bidding, and when things get going wrong, blaming him for what happened. You just read it and you'll see it there. It's also very interesting to read between the lines in the life of Isaac, their son. Remember that Sarah had Isaac when she was 90 years old. She died when she was 127 years old. So she lived 37 years after Isaac was born. Apparently, according to the scriptures, Isaac lived at home those 37 years. And during those first formative years, when psychologists tell us nowadays that the personality is formed, 85% during the first four or five years, Isaac lived in an upside-down marriage home there where there was domineering, Sarai and passive Abram. Now, what happens in a situation like that, honey? Well... Didn't it stop? Yeah, it's okay. Well, of course, that's what I grew up in, yeah. an upside-down marriage, where my mom really was lifing out more of the male role in the home than my dad. My dad was, was, a, was a passive kind of a person. Okay, so I had first-hand experience with that, and... Uh, in counseling, we, I believe the Lord has shown me that this is what happens in a home like that. A boy needs to feel male. That means when I'm five years old, I need to feel like I can throw a rock straighter than a five-year-old girl. I need to feel like I can shoot a slingshot better than she can, uh, handle lizards than she can. You know, this kind of stuff, see? I need that. Now then, I'm also then as I grow up, these things continue with me, although they change uh, a great deal, but the principle is still the same. I have this need. Now then, mom represents all femininity to me. That's a woman. And I need to somehow see myself as stronger than females. Well, you see, you don't get stronger than my mom, man. See, we called her strong as an acre of garlic. You, you don't get stronger than mom. You see that? So that intimidates a little boy. Now, this little boy then, struggling for self-esteem and struggling to get his needs met, he'll go basically one of three ways, although you can do combinations of them. He'll go homosexual. He'll just bail out on ever hoping to be male. And something snaps, and he just does 180. Okay? Now, if he gets saved, that's going to be his flesh. It's going to be his, his version of the flesh. Or you can just go passive. You can just semi-bail out and just kind of become a beggar and go through life accepting whatever crumbs you can get swept off the table to you from the women and the strong males. You see, I be, I'm just anybody's dog that'll hunt with me. See, I'll, I'll be whatever you want me to be. Just please love me. Please accept me. Or you can go macho. You can suck it up and strive to prove to yourself that you're male. Now, if you get saved, all of this then becomes your unique version of the flesh. So this was Isaac's setting, and Isaac took the route of passivity. I really don't believe that the birthright scene was the first time that his devoted wife, Rebecca, had pulled the wool over his eyes. If you'll remember the story, and I'm just going to briefly review it for you. Isaac was old. 
He called Esau in and said, Son, go out and shoot some game and uh, bring it in and cook it for me that I may bless you. Somebody was eavesdropping. Who was it? Rebecca. She called Jacob in and she said, Jacob, I've just heard your dad talking to Esau. Things are not going well here at all. And so I want you to uh, play like your Esau. And Jacob didn't want to. He said, Mom, I can't do that. My arms are smooth and, and Jacob's all, uh, Esau's all hairy. Dad will know. And Rebecca said, Jacob, you let me worry about that. You just do what I tell you to do. And he did. And Jacob then, in turn, became the manipulator and passive. Esau became the macho man of the two. Just read it. It's so interesting. But Jacob was the passive one, depending on mother. I really believe if telephones had been the vogue in Jacob's day, that he would have been calling his mother from Uncle Laban, saying, Mom, what do I do now? Many days. The story of Sarah depicting the dominant woman. <clears throat> I'd like to say this too, Don, that God did not wait until Abram and Sarai cleaned up their act and got their performance lining up now. And then based on their new performance, he gave them a new name. He didn't do that at all. He gave them the name before they ever did anything. And that's a picture of exactly what's happened to you and me, see? He crucified the old you, sinner, son of the devil, and, gay, and spawned the new you out of his spirit gene pool living in the same earth suit and gave you a new name, Saint. Saint, Holy One of God who sins, but who doesn't want to. He hates sin. That's you. So remember who you are, dear brother. Later on then, we see Abraham and Sarah in their pilgrimage as they are, as they are experientially transformed into who they already are. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Right. That's an Old Testament type of what God is, has done with you and is doing. Okay. Here now are some things that Annabelle and I believe Satan can typically accomplish in a home where we've got a gal, and we're talking all Christians now, okay? So this gal has dominant flesh. She is not dominant. She's got dominant flesh. She's our holy, righteous, forgiven, saintly sister in Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. But she's got her flesh problems just like I got mine. And hers is for being strong. So the first one then is emasculation. <clears throat> Oftentimes you'll see her hubby emasculated as well as her sons. In hubby's case, you'll see him begin to will and withdraw making fewer, fewer attempts at decision-making. This can even sp uh, spill over into the area of sex where he can become physically impotent or he'll, he'll just cease to be aggressive at all in the sex area and she will have to be the aggressor in the sexual area. Okay. Would that be more the passive or the macho? That'd be more the passive flesh guy. And listen, brother, if this, if this is talking about your flesh, you are dead to that, bro. That's not you. That's you being controlled by the evil one through the flesh. Remember who you are. Let Christ live through you and begin to life out your true identity in this situation. Then it'll become experiential to you. Okay, the second thing that may happen in a union like this is that the husband will become very sarcastic where he will deliberately try to embarrass his wife in front of other people especially, where he will say cutting remarks to her and try to hurt her, be very sarcastic and hateful to her. Why would he do that? Well, her strength intimidates him and angers him. And so if he can embarrass her or cut her down in front of people, 
that will show them that she's not everything she's cut out to be. And besides, that will give him a chance to show that he is uh, a little bit better. This is your macho flesh guy. Yeah, yeah. that's the macho flesh And that's me. See, this is what, what, what used to be in our home. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, the third one there is I'll just, I just won't go home. The passive or the macho, either one, where he will just avoid going home. He'll stay at the office. Maybe not that he is the president of the office, but at least he's not in this arena where there's somebody always trying to control him, telling him what to do, talking to him with a nagging tone, mm -hmm. and just frustrating him. Right. So he, he just won't go home. Right. <clears throat> the next one is an affair. And this, too, would typically be your macho flesh guy, the Christian guy. Now. This would typically be what would happen. He would go out and seduce women because that builds him up and makes him feel conquering, conquesting male, you see. And uh, this brings to mind a phenomenon known in secular psych as uh, the midlife crisis or male menopause, and you all have read about that. Uh, there are those who say, there are Christians who say that this is a natural phenomenon that every male goes through. I don't believe that. I think that it's a flesh trip. And I think only certain males would go through it, depending upon what kind of the flesh they got. The macho flesh guy would be a setup for it. And so here's the way it would typically happen. Here's a guy, and through the formative years, he somehow is intimidated, and he may be intimidated by females, and he eventually gets married. Now, he gets into sex now with his wife, and he begins to have his... Uh, his his inhibitions kind of lessen because he's pretty successful in the sex area, we'll say. And uh, he's also in the world of work, and let's say he becomes reasonably successful in the world of work. Now, along about age 30 or 35, the power of sin working through his flesh will begin to do this kind of number on him. <clears throat> you know, I really feel like I missed my teen years. I just wish I could go back and be 15 years old again and know what I know now. I didn't even sow my wild oats. I got into this marriage. I'm not even really sure that this is the woman that I really am supposed to be with. I think that I'm missing out on a lot of life. And he drinks it in. He listens to the voice of a stranger. Until along about age 40, he trades his wife in on 220s. You know the story, you know. Gets him a checkered sport coat, grows him a mustache, buys him an RX-711 sport car, you know, and, and here he goes. Now, we all know guys like this, don't we? If these guys are born again, they are controlled by the power of sin through their unique version of the flesh. Now, brother, if the evil one's working this number on you, you are dead to that. That is not you. Claim who you are and hold a funeral to this over here and let Christ live through you. And you'll see victory in this. Okay, the next area is that the husband may become abusive and that's physically abusive to his wife. Um, Bill and I very definitely believe that there's a correlation between the escalation of the dominant female and uh, the abused female. Yeah. Uh, just how far this is going to go and just how uh, tragic the results will be depend on how intense the rejection has been and how intense the emotions are. That's right. In my case, the hostility I felt toward all women was manifested with sarcasm, invective, hateful, being hateful, cutting toward females, but... Well, let me, you know, in your testimony, you'll say that there were these people who kept you from realizing who you were. And so as you, you verbalize it, you say, I set out on a search and destroy mission. That's right. And you destroyed them with your tongue. Well, they were, key, they were a constant reminder to me of how weak I am, and I couldn't accept myself. So after I get saved, then I get this whole new identity, but this hangs on as yeah. flesh. Okay, this can then escalate <clears throat> into rape. It can escalate into multiple rape type thing. It can escalate into murder and uh, serial murder. You, you read in the papers about these guys who, who are serial murderers. 
And who do they kill? Women. And if you look at it, look at the rage involved there. They'll stab this poor lady 62 times or something. That hostility was programmed in there because of their hatred of the female through having been reared around a rejecting or dominant female. So the, the woman who perpetrated that um, may not get the brunt of that, yeah, right? That's right. Yeah. Sad to say. Yeah. And uh, the next one is that the husband may develop a coping mechanism. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, I think of the couple where the wife was a very successful young executive. Um, her husband was a struggling carpenter. Her salary was two, three times as much as his was. She confided in me that he was having a real problem with drinking. And it seemed that the more successful she became, the more difficult his drinking problem was. Well, do you see what was happening? Of course you do. He had developed a coping mechanism where he could anesthetize his self, his brain, for just a little while where he could forget what was happening to him and uh, how he was being reminded by his wife that he was a failure, that he was not succeeding. Uh, maybe he won't resort to that. Maybe a coping mechanism will be a hobby that he'll take up where he'll just uh, stay away from home, but he'll become very interested in that or he'll stay out in the garage all the time, coping, just staying away from this situation. Listen, we're talking to people here sitting tonight. I know we are. And it's flesh we're talking about. Remember that. Right. Anything that he can do where he can prove himself to himself, maybe not to his wife, maybe she's beyond that, but to himself to cope with the situation that he's yeah. in. Or retaliation, Diana. This one would typically be the passive flesh guy in the golden years where the grown children say, I can't believe dad is treating mom the way he's treating her. You know, all these years of hostility, finally he's beginning to spew out all of this rejection which has been pent up in there for years uh, against his wife. May I suggest to y'all that the scriptures say that the male should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. It doesn't say the woman should leave her father and mother and cleave to her husband. It's the opposite way. Why did God say it that way? Because the male has to get out from under this authority in his home and establish his own authority. And it takes two people for an authority position to exist. The authority figure and someone to lead, right? And this is why. Now, Press and I work together in a business, but he does not live under my roof. That won't fly, folks, because Press needs to get out there and establish his own authority. God has designed us this way. I'd even go so far to say, honey, as that is a need in the mail that God can't meet. Wouldn't you? Yeah. This, this need for authority. Yeah, because I've got to be an authority over something if it's going to be met, and you're elected. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I hope y'all don't hear this as a macho kind of thing at all. This isn't, I'm not coming at you with macho. This is the Word of God. We, we're trying to present it lovingly to you by sharing with you that it's all just flesh and, and encouraging you to walk in your true identity. I guess probably the best way to illustrate this would be to let someone who has experienced this give a testimony about it. And so I'm going to read just a paragraph from a letter of a young woman who was this domineering, strong wife. And one day her husband just came in and said, I've had it, I'm leaving. So she was thrust against her will into that group called Single Again. And this is a paragraph from her letter. She says, what an unbelievable mess. Hell on earth, created so quietly 
under a roof in a house that appeared to be a home to the world looking in. All our friends were shocked. They thought our bickering and cute remarks were just in fun. We were all faked out. Now these are two beautiful Christian people. Love the Lord. One of our biggies has been competition. I have beaten him in every physical activity we've ever participated in. I took up bicycling a couple of years ago, worked at it diligently. A 200-mile ride in two days was a recreational trek. I'd think he was a real cream puff because he couldn't whip off 25 miles, just a stroll for me, without being worn out. Tennis? Oh, yes, I could wipe him off the court. I practiced diligently. I took lessons. Had a lot of natural ability, so I couldn't wait to get him on the court to show him how good I was. Last year, we got a big sailboat, 24 feet. He had dreamed of this boat, spent months reading how to maneuver it, how to sail it. Well, let me interrupt you. Can you picture him now in the wintertime, coming home from work, building a fire, kicking back with his book, studying about this sailboat? Now, he's a threatened male flesh guy. And he sees himself out there on the lake sailing this thing, doing it successfully. Reading how to maneuver and sail it. Takes a bit of expertise to put it in the slip without scraping the sides or bumping the bow. Guess who qualified as the expert first try? I did do one thing smart, Annabelle. I never tried to sail it while he was on board. I've really proven myself in many areas. Unfortunately, none that encouraged my husband to want to spend any fun time with me. And you know, I thought he was proud of my accomplishments. Oh, dear sister in Christ, if you've got this dominant flesh, Chances are you're married either to a Christian guy with passive male flesh or you're married to a guy with macho male flesh. Chances are that's the way it's going to be. And if this be true, let me just urge you, don't compete with me. Don't consistently beat me to death at Pinochle, Double Saw, Bridge. I'll start collecting stamps. See, I, I don't... I can't handle your beating me to death like that. Don't consistently beat me sailing and biking and skeet shooting. I'll become a winter camper. I will camp above Timberline in, in wintertime for a week. I'll freeze you out. I'll do something that you can't do so I can feel better about me if I'm on this flesh trip, see? Now, here's one that is so heartbreaking to Annabelle and me. Don't consistently beat me to death with your Christianity or I'll quit going to church with you. You've got four Bibles. You've got them all marked. Uh, you, in the bathroom, you pull the toilet paper and a tract falls out. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I've heard those stories. You go to two Bible studies a week, I hear you talking to your friends on the telephone. You talk like a King James Bible. <laughs> you use words like quicken and tarry. Let's tarry here a while. Hey, nobody says tarry. I mean, you make bathrobes out of that, right? <laughs> See? <clears throat> You treat me like that, and even if I do get saved, I'll be a closet Christian. I am not going to get into another environment with you where you're sitting there in a Mustang with a tank full of gas, and I'm on a moped, see? I cannot handle that. That intimidates me. Okay, honey. Um, we have done a pretty good job of laying it on these women with dominant flesh, okay? Mm -hmm. 
and I imagine that there are women sitting out here now uh, resentful, you're struggling with bitterness, you're struggling with anger, a lot of different things. And honey, I, I would uh, say that if we could get 10 women, and don't raise your hands, if we could get 10 women to volunteer to come up here, that eight out of the 10, I would safely say, would say something like this to us. Now they would say it with different tones, okay? Different emotions. Different emotions. The first group would say something like this. Look, I don't want to be the head. I've never wanted to be the head. I have tried my best to get this man to take over, and he will not. Will you tell me how to motivate him? These would typically be the older ones. Those probably. would probably be the older. Mm -hmm. The younger women who have fallen into this category would verbalize it differently. They, they might say something like, okay, okay, you've made your point. Now tell me how to dynamite the bum off the divan and we'll be okay. Help me. What they're both saying is, okay, I know that, but help me. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have asked the Lord to give us some steps for the woman to help her have a strategy for counteracting Satan's strategy as he's trying to destroy this marriage. In other words, steps for defusing this volatile situation. Number one is appropriate. This is claim by faith that you are dead to this whole thing insofar as your ability to turn it around, but that you are now alive in Christ and he is living through you to life out your proper role in the marriage through you. And if you're to do that now, you're going to be obedient. This will make you obedient, letting him live through you. Secondly, release this whole problem to the Lord. Annabelle has a teaching on our last series of tapes, Victorious Christian Living, on how to give a burden to the Lord, where you give this to God and put the ball in his court to use you to turn the thing around. Third step, submit. This is one of the key issues, dear sister, in this situation. You are not submitting to authority, to God's authority and to your hubby's authority because all authority comes from God, the Word of God says. So one of the keys here is to get under God's submission and your hubby's submission. The fourth thing is let Christ live through you to encourage and build up and edify your hubby and say, I'm pulling for you, George. I'm really encouraging you, George. I'm pulling for you to really life out your role here in the marriage. And then lastly, confront him. And I facetiously say once a quarter. Now, I don't really mean that. But see, if you confront him every day and tell him that he's not performing well, that's nagging, isn't it? So kind of, you know, like once a quarter. You must kind of decrease, like the John the Baptist story. I must decrease that he might increase. You're going to let Christ live through you to, to, to provide a more therapeutic environment for your hubby to kind of let Christ live through him and begin to take over his own role. Mm -hmm. Let me pick up on that number in courage there. All right. Okay, uh, give you an illustration of this, gals, that uh, happened in our lives two or three years ago. Um, I was, uh, Bill and I were home. I was in the kitchen fixing supper. Bill was out on the driveway working on a bicycle that had broken down trying to get it fixed. And uh, so everything in the kitchen kind of seemed to be status quo and I thought I could go outside. So. Uh, I decided to go out and see how Bill was coming on the bicycle repair job. So just as I stepped out the door, I saw Bill and he was down on his knees working on this bicycle. He was in a very awkward position and tension was written all over his face. And he looked up and he said, Hi, I'm so glad you're here. Come here quick, I need you. Now the minute Bill said that, my emotions went up. Why? 
because I don't perform to please Bill in situations like this. I don't like to help him in situations like that because I just don't do it right. And the thought comes to me, I wish I'd never come out here. <laughs> but I hurry over and he says, pick up that screwdriver and put it on this little screw. So I pick up the screwdriver, but f for the life of me, I can't see the screw. And I say, honey, I don't see what screw you're talking about. That screw. <laughs> no, you didn't. You didn't say it like that the oh. first time. <laughs> he patiently said, that screw there. And he just had one finger and he let, would... Let me share with these guys. Hey, guys, I'm, I've got a pair of pliers and I'm holding a spring-loaded bolt, right? You know, you know, and I'm, uh, I'm pointing with a little finger. That one there. See. I couldn't see it. And so the tension mounted. Uh, finally, I saw what he was talking about. I got the screwdriver placed where he wanted it, which released him to go get the bolt or whatever it was he needed. So now I'm sitting on my knees and I have the screwdriver placed there. And thoughts began to come to me that uh, might be very helpful in this situation. Thoughts that have come to me so many times that they're very familiar to me, thoughts that I've spewed out many times. This was the main one that I could say to Bill, something like this. I just never seem to please you when I try to help you this way, dear. And if I had said that with the proper inflection, what would that have done to you, honey? Well, my flesh pattern would be to blame you for the whole situation, you know. So a thought would come to me like, well, it looks like to me that anybody could see where the screwdriver was supposed to go. Right. <laughs> but another thought came to me at the same time. Now listen, this is a real life setting where you apply these things. See, another thought came to me. And this was the thought. Just amazes me how you can take these bikes and repair them this way. Now that was a rather nauseating thought. <laughs> But was from the Lord. But <laughs> <laughs> right on. Amen. Preach it, brother. <laughs> Being the dutiful <laughs> wife. That's what I said. Teeth gritted. I said. Just amazes me, honey, how you can work on these bikes and fix them. What the how, that... How'd you do that, Don? Oh, with great difficulty. Yeah, but how? <laughs> now, your feeler ain't in it, right? No. Feeler doesn't want to go, but how did you do that? It was sweet. It came out sweet. Uh -huh. I did it by allowing Christ to do it through me. No, you did. So, did you take over? No, I just, just did it. I couldn't whistle. But just, <laughs> you just acted it out, believing that he was doing it. Right. And it was a healing thing. Mm -hmm. It, I responded, you know, like, oh, you know, there's nothing to it. You know? okay. I repeat, rather nauseating. <laughs> <laughs> Dear people, that is the victorious Christian life. That's it. See? That is the abundant life. That's it. How many days of our marriage have I ruined over stuff like that? Or have you ruined over stuff? It's just tremendous, right? What I'm trying to communicate, gals, is this. As being obedient to the Lord, I am to be my husband's staunchest supporter. I am to be his encourager. I'm not to be his most severe critic. And our time's about up. May I close with this? Uh, what, you, what is that? Present statement. Oh, let me say this, Don, before you do that. Um, the passive flesh man, you know, things will come like the kid is supposed to ask dad, you know, the 16 year old boy, I want to take the car and drive 40 miles to a party over here and it's a foggy night, see. The guy is supposed to say, George, you can't do that. Now you just can't have the car to do that. And, but he'll just sit there with the attitude, I'm out of it because the power of sin will tell him, I'm out of it. He just spits it out, I'm out of it, see. Mm -hmm. And, and so what he, we need the guy to stand up and say, George, you can't do that. Well, so let's say he trusts Christ as his life. George, you can't do that. I'm sorry, but you can't have the card tonight. Now, how is he going to feel? He's going to feel intimidated. 
power of sin is going to start kicking the daylights out of him and he's thoughtless, see? They're all mad at me. She's thinking, well, look who stood up and tried to take over. It'll be interesting to see how long this one lasts. See? And, and uh, I'm a biggest phony in, in Atlanta. Who am I trying to kid anyway? See? This intimidation, trying to, trying to intimidate him where he'll say, well, I guess just go ahead and go if you want to and lapse back into that passivity again. Dear brother, you are dead to that. You're being controlled by the power of sin. That is not you. You're this other guy, this righteous man in Christ. It just doesn't feel like it. See? But by the word of God, this is who you really are. Okay, so... Um, yeah, share with share okay. This statement that uh, is in the study guide, the leader's guide that Pris wrote, I think really is beautiful and I think will summarize what we've been saying. Encouragement in the marriage should be for small things as well as larger things. It should not center on performance tasks that are well done. Characteristics, attributes, desires, and admirable qualities are good objects for encouragement as well. This perspective will act to build up the person for who they are and not just for what they've done. Like, you are a gift from God to me. Right. And I love you. And I accept every part of you. Right. That kind of stuff. Right. Right. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for this now. Thank you, sir, that we have just been discussing flesh tonight, not people. Lord, show us by your spirit, from your word, who we are, that we can offer ourselves to you to let you life that out in victory to Christ's glory. Amen. Thank you for having been with us for part one of Diffusing the Self-Destruct Marriage. In our next session, part two, Bill and Annabelle will deal with communication and commitment as primary tools for building or rebuilding a marriage. We trust that these will be meaningful and profitable principles as you look to the Lord to meet the needs in your life.